Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully you can uh, see and hear me clearly. For some reason, the lighting situation in my room is pretty poor. But then again, I do live in England, so you should expect. Uh, I have two lights on currently and the, whip, the uh, curtains open, but living in England, you don't get much sunlight. Um, just want to say a big welcome to Seb Alex. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. And Seb's going to be talking about the importance of animal rights, especially for antinatalists. But before we get into it, I'll say a few words, if you don't mind, Seb, to uh, introduce you. So Seb is an activist, lecturer, photojournalist and author. Born and raised in Lebanon, his animal advocacy has taken him to North America, Europe, Asia and Australia. He is a co-founder of the Middle East Vegan Society, a non-profit that promotes plant-based eating and awareness of animal issues in the Middle East and Africa. He's also built a large social media following by sharing his compassionate message with uh, over 100,000 followers on Instagram alone. I think at AA we have about 80, so we're very, very jealous. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Seb, to tackle this important and thorny issue. Uh, as before with David Pierce's talk, if you'd like to submit any questions, please do put them in the form and then I'll try to get through everyone's questions at the end of the session. Um, yeah, any questions in the chat, please do pop them in the form so we'll make sure that they're filtered through to us. Yeah, that's everything from me. So uh, over to you, Seb. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I'm just going to prepare my slides. Uh, okay. I'll just try the sharing screen option. That might be easier. Right. Uh, oh, there you go. Can you see your slides up on up on screen? All oh, right, I can see them now, actually. Perfect. Yeah, I don't need to share my screen. All right, thank you very much um, for the introduction and also for the invitation. I'm happy to be here and thank you everyone who has joined. Um, I just want to mention that I can't see anybody's uh, questions and comments now, but I'm sure we can go through them later on. So um, if I don't answer anything on the spot, it's because I don't have any access to them straight away. So. I'm born and raised in Lebanon. I've been an animal rights activist for around nine years. And um, I believe animal rights is a very, very important cause um, all around the world, uh, regardless of what other causes someone is involved in. Uh, even if they can't commit all their right to animal rights, they should at least make sure that they're not violating the rights of other animals. So today I want to talk about the importance of animal rights in the from the context of logic and uh, what is the philosophy itself, because with the rise of any movement and any let's, like ideology let's say a lot of people join and with time the core message starts getting diluted and i really believe that people should know what is the simple philosophy of animal rights it's not as complicated as some people want to make it sound so in 1973 the american writer ursula le guin wrote this short philosophical fiction it's called those who walk away from omelas and it consists of the story of this a city called Omelas where everyone lived beautiful lives. Uh, they had everything they needed and um, they had uh, festivals, uh, cultural events. They had food all the time. Everyone had shelter, social health care, education. Life was great. However, the plot of the story is that for the serenity of the city to continue and that peace and happiness to continue, there should be this one child that is left in a small room uh, facing and experiencing all types of misery and suffering. And once the citizens of the city are old enough, they're taken to that place and they're shown the kid and, and they come face to face to what their happiness and tradition and everything they've been doing uh, relies on, which is the suffering of that poor kid. Uh, majority of the uh, citizens Actually, all of them, of course, get shocked. Majority just go back to the city. They don't do anything about it. But a small fraction of them decide that this is unacceptable and they decide to leave the city. Uh, they don't know where they're going, but what they do know is that they will not be coming back and they are the ones who walk away from Omelas. Now, around five, 
four or five years ago now, actually, uh, I found myself standing in front of the head of a cow inside a slaughterhouse. I was inside documenting what's happening to these animals. And when I went back home where I was staying at the time, there was a dog and the dog came close to me and started sniffing the, the blood stains that were on my pants and shoes. And as she was sniffing, I thought how weird it is that the place of this animal is inside our house, is protected by us, cared by us, loved by us. But the place of a cow is inside a slaughterhouse, hanging upside down with her head on the floor. So I have to say that the case of animal rights itself is not that different from the uh, from the story of those who walk away from Omelas. Neither is how people react to the subject once they learn about it. Some people decide to go back and continue, even if they don't like what they saw, the footage that comes out of the slaughterhouses and the farms. And some people decide to walk away from it. Now, personally, around, um, I think it's been more than 15 years now, um, my brother came home one day with this cat that he found on the street uh, and my parents had this golden rule in the house which was no animals in the house and so when he got home with this cat who was just a few weeks old um, we had a massive argument at home and my mom decided at the end that we can keep the keep the cat uh, even though we were not supposed to i was very upset because i thought if if we're going to break the golden rule then might as well get a dog but uh, at the end of the day the the cat ended up acting more like a dog than a cat so it was a win-win so i accepted that and eventually this cat became like a big part of the family and many of my friends knew about him as well uh, he was a very special cat, acted like a dog, as I said, would run to you if you said come, he would sit down if you told him to sit, he would fetch and any other thing that you can imagine. Eventually, one day, my mom said that she wanted to do an operation. She wanted to declaw the cat because he was destroying all the furniture, the, the couches. And of course, I was against this. And at the time, I didn't know what to do, but I was arguing with my mom many times and she wouldn't agree to not do it. So I resorted to the only option that I had, uh, which was launch a Facebook group against my mom and uh, invite all my friends to join uh, to join the group and share what they thought about my mom's decision. And because we lived in a small flat, I would read the comments out loud. And eventually my mom decided to not do the operation. And so we claimed victory and the cat got to keep his nails. Now, at the time I had a friend who was vegetarian and she said, it's really great what you did for your cat, but I really, would appreciate it if you act if you stop acting like you're an animal lover and i said what do you mean she said well you're not an animal lover you, you just love your cat and obviously i didn't like hearing that and so we, we started arguing and she said how can you claim to be an animal lover if you eat meat if you eat other animal products you go hunting every now and then uh, you're not an animal lover if you're only protecting your cat you just love your cat end of story we continued arguing and eventually she sent me a video from slaughterhouses called um, Meet Your Meat, if I'm not mistaken. It was around 10 minutes long, uh, slaughter basic slaughterhouse um, footage from all around the world. And when I finished watching the video, I thought, well, I have to really come up with a good excuse unless I decide to stop eating animals. And she was vegetarian and I couldn't come up with any excuse. So I became vegetarian. Now, a few years later, I learned about um, veganism through a documentary called Earthlings. And that documentary was talking about speciesism, which is the next concept, concept or idea that I would like to talk about. So speciesism is often the term that is used to describe the type of double standards that I personally held as well. And although at the time I believe my new stance was a strong one, I have come to the realization now that there's a much more important context here that is not often talked about when it comes to animal rights. And it's the reason why so many people either quit veganism or don't want to identify with veganism or oppose veganism and animal rights altogether. Now, one assumption that justifies this kind of discrimination towards other animals is that they are inferior to or less valuable than humans. However, the position of animal rights is not here to claim that other animals are just as valuable or more valuable than humans. The position is that other animals deserve basic rights. That's it. We're not here to claim which one is more valuable than the other. Now, since harm is being done directly to other animals, the question central to the case of animal rights is about negative rights. And for those of you who don't know, there are two types of rights, positive rights and negative rights. Positive rights are rights such as the right to education, the right to healthcare, and other things. Negative rights are similar to the right not to be harmed, the, the right not to be exploited or enslaved, or of course, killed. Now, it's also important to mention that having rights is like having an invisible shield that can protect us from being used, exploited, 
or harmed. They are not a gift or a result of generosity and compassion. They are what we are due. So rights are basically about fairness. Based on what rights are, it's safe to say that if we conclude that other animals deserve negative rights, at least to begin with, then we have to accept that what we are doing to them now directly violates their rights and should be stopped no matter how much some people might benefit from these rights violations. So we're going to ask ourselves a question that will help us find out if what we are doing to other animals is moral or not based on our current, current moral values. And that question is the following. Can you name the trait? What is that trait that these other animals have that we don't, that if we were to apply to a human, would justify treating the human the same way? So to make it more simple, what is it that these animals have? What trait can each of us think of? And this is why I, I want to make the case that animal rights is about logical um, explanation. It's, it's not some weird um, mental dynamics that we're going to play. It's simply logical uh, extension of what we already believed in that I, I want to talk about later on, which is human rights. So what is that one trait that these other animals have that if we were to take from them, like let's say a trait that a pig or a fish or a cow has, if we were to take that copy and paste it onto a human, it would now be morally acceptable to treat these humans the same way. So can we actually think of a trait? Now, it's very simple. I want to go through basic um, history of philosophy and mention a few philosophers and what they each talked about when it comes uh, to animal rights, because many of them thought that they had found the trait that justifies treating other animals in a different way than the way that we treat each other. So in order to convince people to be open to animal rights and have the conversation, I believe it's easier to treat animal rights as an ex existing issue that they already agree with. And so that's where the human rights part comes in. When we believe in human rights, we're not claiming that all humans are exactly the same, with the same um, IQ levels, with the same talents, with the same uh, background of eye color, hair color, whatever. We are basically accepting that we are different when we believe in human rights, but we're also accepting that the differences are not morally relevant differences, right? It doesn't matter how smart I am. It doesn't matter what color my eyes are. It doesn't matter what language someone speaks uh, in order to decide whether or not this person deserves basic moral rights. So this is the philosophy of human rights. So if we were to show people that by simply extending this logic on animal rights, basically what's, what we're doing to other animals, we would realize that other animals also deserve basic moral rights. These people would be more open to the message because they will not perceive animal rights as a new philosophy that's being introduced. It's literally the application of an existing thought pattern on new victims that we have ignored all this time. So let's start by going through the philosophers one by one. And we're going to start with the French philosopher René Descartes. So people who followed the philosophy of the French philosopher Descartes have used this argument for decades. And that's the argument that these animals have a specific trait, which is that of lack of communication, right? So they've tried this to, they've used this trait to justify treating other animals in a different way. They didn't think that animals were less sentient or conscious than humans. They believed that animals felt nothing. So it's not even the fact that they thought they're not as advanced as us, as us. They thought animals do not feel anything, end of story. And for this reason, they felt that it's completely fine and morally acceptable to nail dogs to boards and vivisect them alive, claiming that since other animals can't use language like English or French to communicate with us, then they surely lack mental life and don't feel anything at all. They're like objects, and since they are like objects, they cannot offer any compelling evidence that they're aware of anything. So this is one trait that someone can give. We're gonna go through different traits based on different philosophers and philosophy um, schools. And uh, we're gonna see if it makes sense. So in this case, the trait of lack of communication, if we just simply look at the science, it's important to clarify that most of the animals out there are indeed both conscious and sentient and do communicate, but in their own ways. In fact, the science has been very clear and it has been a while that it's been clear. In 2012, a prominent international group of cognitive, cognitive neuroscientists actually gathered at the University of Cambridge and signed the Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness where they claimed, and I quote, that the weight of evidence of uh, that the weight of evidence indicates 
that humans are not unique in possessing the neurological substrates that generate consciousness. Non-human animals, including all mammals and birds and many other creatures, including octopuses, also possess these neurological substrates. Now, when it comes to Darwin, when he was writing of mammalian animals, he observed there is no fundamental difference between men and the higher animals in their mental faculties. The difference in the mental life of human beings and mammals, he added, is one of degree, not of kind. Now, scientific facts put aside, the fact that one may not be able to use language does not suddenly make their nervous system and brain disappear. To accept these ideas is to reject both scientific fact and logic. Now, the next trait that we're going to be talking about is the fact that these other animals don't have any rights. In uh, any rights, in fact, it's never about rights. It's always about the greatest good for the greatest number. This comes from one of the most influential moral theories that is often talked about, even in the animal rights context, which is utilitarianism which was founded by Jeremy Bentham. And in fact, it seems to be very convincing at first because it accepts two principles. The first is the principle of equality. Everyone's preferences count and similar preferences must be counted as having similar weight and importance. The second point is utility. We ought to do the act that brings about the greatest amount of good possible. In other words, utilitarianism holds that the most ethical choice at any time is the one that will produce the greatest good for the greatest number. But the weak point of utilitarianism when it comes to moral rights is that in order to figure out what is the most moral action in any situation, we first have to calculate all the pleasure it creates for everyone involved. This involves taking into consideration the pleasure that criminals may get from harming others. So can we genuinely and comfortably count the satisfaction of, for example, a child abuser before deciding to condemn abuse. The very idea of doing so, in my opinion, is an insult to morality. In the same way, can we genuinely and comfortably count the satisfaction we get from eating animal flesh or dairy products before deciding to condemn animal exploitation and killing? Now, when it comes to utilitarianism, it's also important to talk about Peter Singer. Uh, the majority of people who talk about animal rights, even if they're not vegans, always refer to Peter Singer as the grandfather of the animal rights movement. But this couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, utilitarianism does not and cannot accept any individual rights. So it doesn't make sense for Peter Singer to be the grandfather of a movement called animal rights. And in fact, that will always remain its strongest critique. It is no wonder that even one of the most famous books written on the case of animals called Animal Liberation by Peter Singer did not even make Peter Singer himself go vegan because Peter Singer accepts that animals deserve, uh, cannot even accept that animals deserve negative rights, which is why it continues, of course, to shock uh, many people when they find out that he himself is not even vegan. This is why utilitarianism will never be a strong ground to build a case for animal rights. We need a system that considers an act to be immoral because it violates certain moral rights, not a system that waits until we have calculated how much pleasure each individual got while doing the act before deciding if it's the moral thing to do. Now, the next trait that we will be talking about is the fact that other animals have no understanding of rights and morality. So someone can say, well, you're asking what is a trait that these other animals have that we don't, that if we were to apply to us, it would be justified. The trait is the fact that these animals cannot understand what rights are. They cannot understand rules. They cannot understand morality. So this trait specifically was often used by those who followed the moral theory called contractarianism, which has a very clear position regarding morality. Those who frame moral contracts, such as laws, for example, are the ones who matter morally, since other animals are not part of this process, so they can sit down and have meetings with us and discuss about laws and morality. No matter how much they are like contractors, psychologically speaking, they have no moral standing. The main issue with contractarianism is that it could be used specifically by groups to exploit and discriminate against others. For example, if a higher white class decided to frame the contracts, those belonging to other races, such as marginalized or historically oppressed groups, were not part of this process and were therefore not taken into consideration. And this is obviously a very weak part of the philosophy of contractarianism. Until John Rawls came, 
John Rawls, who many of you might know already, the famous 20th century political philosopher, had his own solution to the problem of contractarianism that we just mentioned. His idea, which was coined Rawls in contractarianism, consisted of making the moral contracts behind what he calls the veil of ignorance. So we are to make the contracts without knowing what position, background, or class we will have in the society we will live in. One should not know if they are to be, let's say, an athlete or a doctor, a man or a woman, a white person or a black person. So this results in having a set of fair rules as no one will make a rule that may be in their disadvantage since they're acting behind the veil of ignorance. Otherwise, contractors might risk harming themselves. It all sounds, of course, quite convincing, but when it comes to other animals, John Rawls believed that we only have direct duties towards those who have a sense of justice. And since other animals don't have a sense of justice, he believed that this trait justifies not owing them any rights. Now, he was not the only one who thought this way. In fact, another moral theory that tries to use this trait is Kantianism from the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who believed that all human beings have inherent value and no one should be used as means for an end, which sounds absolutely amazing. He opposed utilitarianism by explaining that just because an action can bring a lot of good does not make it a moral action. So we can talk about the Tuskegee syphilis study, where with the help of the US government, uh, hundreds of black people were used for a study. Uh, they were told that they, were be, they are going to be given uh, medicine, but in fact, they were given syphilis and then they, they studied all the cases um, and they basically made it a medical study without actually the, con the consent of the people who were taken part in it. Um, so of course, under utilitarianism, someone can look into the, po the positive outcomes of that, but under Kantianism, this of course would be completely immoral because you're violating the basic moral rights of the individuals. So although Kant has a very appealing sense of moral justice, he also believed that those who have rights are those who can be held morally responsible. Since other animals have no rights, uh, we can basically use them as means for an end that end being humans. So we have to really ask ourselves if the, the trait of uh, lacking a sense of justice, um, for example, the, the way contractarianism and roles in contractarianism uh, use in order to justify. Uh, we have to think if whether or not you lack this trait suddenly takes away the right for you to have basic moral rights. and very simple example of that can be, for example, human babies or adults with cognitive disabilities. Should they not have any rights since they have no understanding of justice? No human of goodwill would ever suggest that we exploit, use, or kill humans who lack a sense of justice. So if we were to take the trait that is no understanding of basic moral rights or justice, apply it onto a human, would it justify to treat the human the same way? Of course not. So therefore, this argument cannot be the trait that specifies that uh, justifies um, the way that we treat other animals. Although a lot of philosophers try to use it, once we apply it onto a human, it makes absolutely no sense. The next trait that I want to talk about is something that is very often used by a lot of people, especially online, unfortunately, is the fact um, that other animals have lower IQ levels. Now, I do want to also mention that IQ levels are made to understand the intelligence of human beings. So it's very arrogant of humans to think that the same way, um, the same test should be run on other animals in order to justify how intelligent they are. So it's quite a common trait that we hear nowadays and that makes, um, basically it makes people think that it's justified to not give other animals basic moral rights. Uh, it's absolutely ridiculous to claim something like this. If you were to take the, the trait, which is lower IQ level, apply it onto a human, would you be able to justify exploiting a human, killing a human and treating them in ways that are harmful just because they're not as smart as you, of course not, that is unacceptable, and therefore it's a morally irrelevant trait. And if it is the case, then we cannot justify what we're doing to other animals based on the fact that they are not as smart as us. Now, those who possess advanced rational uh, capabilities based on Aristotle enjoy a higher moral status than those who do not. It's absolutely, Ridiculous, but um, Aristotle was one of those people who believed that the smarter you are, 
the more you are entitled to rights. This is why he ended up classifying women as less morally worthy than men, and that those who are deficient when it comes to rational capabilities are born to be the slaves of those who have higher rational capabilities. I hope I don't have to explain why that is not only illogical, but also scientifically completely wrong. Now, when it comes to lower IQ levels, this is not the first time that um, people have tried to use this trait in order to justify exploitation. And in fact, when there was a, uh, a big movement against uh, the, the slave trade industry, there was a French priest called Henry Gregoire. He worked on a book showcasing the artistic and intellectual work of Africans. And he thought, if I can only show the world that these Africans that are being taken slaves um, are just as smart as us, they're just as talented and, and can be as intellectual as us, then people would not treat them the way they treat them, right? I, I just have to show that they don't have a lower IQ level than us. So he sent this uh, letter to Thomas Jefferson, who was also against the slave trade industry. Um, and Thomas Jefferson replied to this letter by saying, whatever be their degree of talent, it is no measure of their rights. Basically saying like, yeah, it's a great thing that you're doing, but it's irrelevant how smart they are. It's irrelevant how talented they are, because that is not how we should be me measuring their rights. Now, the next trait I want to talk about is something that is, is used um, often, but it's, it's a very, it's not a genuine answer. All right. Some people use biological truths such as uh, they are not humans, right? Such truths have no moral importance. All they tell us is that some people belong to, um, some beings belong to one biological species, while other beings belong to another biological species. But who belongs to what species is not relevant to this question. So when you say it's, it's okay to do this to another animal because they are X, X being a biological truth about this animal, that's a completely arbitrary thing to say and therefore has no place in, in philosophical debates in any way, especially when it comes to morality. Now, moral rights can never justifiably be denied for arbitrary reasons, except if we want to live in a world where factors such as race and gender can be used to deny moral rights of other humans. We can stay here all day and name traits, but not a single one of these traits would hold ground when applied to a hypothetical situation where it is true of a human. At the end of the day, the argument against animal rights remains arbitrary or logically fallacious by appealing to culture, to tradition, or to pleasure. Now, what, do this, what does this all come down to? You know, do we, do we just give these animals the same rights that we have? Um, are, are humans and other animals the same? Um, if we're all the same, uh, are human rights um, because of the fact that, that humans, well, are human rights because of humans being the same? No, of course not. We recognize already that we don't have to be the same in order to have the same human rights, we acknowledge the differences, but we also acknowledge that they are morally irrelevant differences. So similarly, the notion of animal rights is not to say all animals and humans are the same. It's to recognize that there are a lot of differences between us, but also recognize that their differences are morally irrelevant differences, which is why, for example, it does not, it does not make any sense um, to claim, for example, chickens should have the right to um, drive a car or a cow should have the right to vote because these rights are completely irrelevant to these animals. We need to give them rights that are in their own benefit. And I'm mentioning that because unfortunately it's very common for people to say, well, what does this mean? You know, you, you're going to give these animals the same rights that humans have. It's not about that. It's about giving them what they actually deserve. So in his book, Justice, which is written by uh, the American philosopher Michael Sandel, while talking about the case of the Queen versus Dudley and Stevens, he raised the question in defense of a weak orphan boy who was killed and eaten by two adults while all three were stuck and starving on a small boat for 24 days with no one to rescue in sight. He wrote in the book, even if all things considered, the benefits do outweigh the costs. Don't we have a nagging sense that killing and eating a defenseless cabin boy is wrong for reasons that go beyond the calculation of social costs and benefits? Isn't it wrong to use a human being in this way, exploiting his vulnerability, taking his life without his consent, 
even if doing so benefits others. So to make it clearer, there was a shipwreck, a few people survived, and there was an orphan boy with them. And after 24 days out of desperation and hunger, they decided to kill and eat the boy in order to survive. Now, the interesting thing is that when they were saved, they actually told the people what they did, thinking that people would understand and say, oh yeah, it makes sense that you did that. But of course they were actually charged with murder. Now, what I wanna do is here is I just wanna ask what would happen if we were to replace the cabin boy with any other animal, right? Can we find a reasonable way to answer the same question that Michael Sander raised? Even if all things considered the benefits do outweigh the costs, don't we have a nagging sense that killing and eating a defenseless animal is wrong for reasons that go beyond the calculation of social costs and benefits? Isn't it wrong to use an, another animal in this way, exploiting their vulnerability, taking their life without their consent, even if doing so benefits others? Now, someone can say, well, I have an objection, and that's that there's a very big difference between these two examples, but the only difference that I personally see is the fact that the two adults were starving to death and had no other options, whereas the majority of human population is not exploiting and killing other animals out of necessity. And even in the situation where they were starving, they were still found guilty of murder. So brings us back to our question. Can you name the trait that is true of other animals that if true of another human would justify treating the human the same way? If you believe that there's any moral difference between these two cases, I invite you to name the trait that introduces these differences. Until you find one, I would like to ask you all who unlike the people of Omelas, the book that we talked about in the beginning, who unlike them, do not depend on exploiting other animals to live safe, happy, healthy, and blissful lives. If you know that for your meal, a cow was slaughtered against her will, a calf was taken away from her mother, a male chick was thrown in a macerator for being useless in the, in the egg industry, a pig was put in a gas chamber before slaughter to be sold as humanely killed. If we know that there is a massacre of around 84,000 animals per second, can we comfortably let others continue doing what they do? Or should we get them to go, let's say, vegan and stop contributing to the suffering of other animals the way the people of Omelas stopped contributing to the suffering of the child? Or in fact, should we get them to do what the people of Omelas should have done, which was go back to the city, inform people about the suffering kit and bring justice to the individual whose rights are being violated? If vegans were responsible for 0.1% of the damage and destruction of the animal agriculture industry, we'd be classified as domestic terrorists and thrown in jails. Yet we are being accused of being that for simply documenting the crimes that are taking place inside this industry. I would like to ask you all to always try your best to make sure that people not only agree with animal rights, but also feel the responsibility to take action in any way possible to join this movement. So if you are not vegan yourself, please ask yourself why you haven't been applying this logical extension of human rights onto other animals. This is the least that other animals deserve in my opinion. Now I wanna to finish today's talk with a beautiful poem written by Abu Ala al Ma'ari, who lived almost a thousand years ago, a Syrian poet who also happened to be an antinatalist and he was a vegan. He was uh, blind from the age of four and a thousand years ago. He was not only vegan, but debating animal rights back and forth with other intellectuals, philosophers, and poets. The poem is, I no longer steal from nature. And it says, you are diseased in understanding and religion. Come to me that you may hear something of sound truth. Do not unjustly eat fish the water has given up and do not desire as food the flesh of slaughtered animals or the white milk of mothers who intended its pure draught for their young, not noble ladies. And do not grieve the unsuspecting birds by taking eggs for injustice is the worst of crimes. And spare the honey which the bees get industriously from the flowers of fragrance, fragrance plants. For they did not store it that it might belong to others nor did they gather it for bounty and gifts. I wash my hands of all this and wish that I perceived my way before my hair went gray. 
Abu Ala al Ma'ariz Thompson said, This crime done to me by my father was done to no one. And that was his stance when it comes to antinatalism as well. So thank you so much, all of you, for joining. And um, I think we can start taking questions now. Great. Thank you so much, Seb. Um, a really amazing quote there by Al Mari, as you were saying, from a thousand years ago, a vegan yeah. and antinatalist. Uh, he's my go-to example when people say that this is all just some modern thing that you're doing. That, yes. You know, these millennials have invented this or whatever. I always point to that thousand-year-old poem. Um, so just going through the questions now. So if everyone was to take your advice and go vegan, it does appear that there would be uh, an antinatal, our actions would have antinatalist consequences on animals. We wouldn't be bringing these farm animals into existence. So to what extent do you separate antinatalism and veganism um, firstly, in your advocacy, but also in terms of how you understand the philosophies? That's a good question. Um, when it comes to my advocacy, I'm, I'm very careful of when I bring which topic, right? I'm, I'm firstly an animal rights activist, and uh, my stance on antinatalism came to me after becoming an animal rights activist. Um, my main worry um, is, of course, the incredible amount of harm that we're causing onto other animals. And by becoming an animal rights activist and, and a vegan, of course, you're taking away all of that contribution that you have already, which, you know, as antinatalists, we wanna, we believe in what we believe because we, we understand what suffering means and we wanna stop that type of suffering. So for me, it's not even a question that the first step should be to go vegan if you believe in antinatalism. Why, why else would you want to make sure that there is not like so much suffering in the world? Um, so I, I definitely think that there's a direct link between the two, but the link is more of a strong link of if you believe in antinatalism, you have no other option. You have no justifiable way of continuing to uh, consume animal products. Um, the other way around, I think if, if I, I, I imagine myself to have been an antinatalist first and then come across animal rights, um, I think that would, that would again be an extension of my, um, like, it's like a logical extension of what I already believe in, mm. right? So, so I think, yeah, in, in, my, in my specific case, personally, I was like first an animal rights activist, then came across antinatalism. But I think the other way is also a very simple um, and, and easy like extension of what you already believe in. Uh, do I separate the two philosophies in, in my advocacy? Yes, I do. Um, I've found, you know, when, when you talk about animal rights, it's already such a triggering topic for majority of people. Yeah. I, I think because of the fact that, um, that they take part in it, right? If you talk about animal rights, but you talk about bullfighting, everyone would be like, yeah, very bad, because most of the people don't take part in bullfighting. So it's easy to stand up against something that you're not contributing to. Um, I found that case to be even worse with antinatalism. And I think the reason for that is because unlike bullfighting or eating animals, um, giving birth is a natural thing. Uh, if anything, we can make the case that it, it is the main reason that we are alive to pass on our genes, right? So it's even more triggering because of the fact that it's a natural thing. But of course, I mean, mm. I'm not saying therefore it's good because then I'm just appealing to nature, which, which is a logical fallacy. Um, but no one can say that it's natural for us to what we're doing to other animals because it's not but someone can try to start defend their stance of being pro natalism by saying, well, this is how we are as human beings. This is what we do. Right. So I, I found the, the, the reaction to be much stronger to antinatalism. Yeah. My fear is usually if I link both together in my advocacy is to completely lose the person. And when I do that, then they're not going to listen to animal rights. And the result of that is also that hundreds, if not thousands of animals are going to be killed throughout this person's life because they didn't take their time to listen to me. 
because the topic of antinatalism completely put them off. Yeah. So I'm usually very careful in the steps that lead towards antinatalism. To give a very simple example, um, last weekend I gave a lecture and uh, afterwards there was a journalist who uh, asked me a few questions about animal rights and eventually the topic went into antinatalism, which she wasn't even aware of. She didn't even know something of the sort existed, but I felt comfortable to talk about it because it was like a quite a um, gradual way the conversation evolved. So then, then I felt safe and she was actually very interested. Um, so I think it's um, unfortunately a difficult conversation mixed with an already quite um, emotionally charged conversation. Definitely. I think people generally, when you talk to them about animal rights, they have an inkling that something is wrong. Whereas when you talk to them for the first time about antinatalism, it's easier to dismiss you as a crank or a weirdo. Yeah. Um, and yeah. then op and then sadly use that to dismiss your position on animal rights as well, exactly. which they were probably closer to getting. And um, we've got a question here about whether or not you are categorically opposed to moral agents breeding non-human animals. Like, is it... We, we talked about eating animals, like killing the animals as being categorically wrong. Does the breeding of animals, does, is that also categorically wrong in your opinion? Yeah, because um, humans should have no right to bring into existence even another animal. Who are we to, to bring another animal into existence? The only reason why we do that is for human gains. We, we never do it in order to please the other animal that we're bringing into existence, you know, take from puppy breeding to, to breeding of farm animals, to breeding mm. horses, you know, it, it, it blows my mind that, that these industries even exist, you know, to create other animals into existence for, for human profit. Basically I, I am yes, opposed to that. Yeah. And I do have a technical philosophical point. You mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we're talking about, uh, negative obligations not to infringe with animals when it comes to animal rights with respect to wild animals when animals are breeding in the wild and then those animals will you know eat each other alive or animals yes. will die of disease and this kind of thing do we have any positive obligations to stop those animals from breeding to protect their mm -hmm. offspring offspring who will yeah. tend to go on to live um, yeah. unfortunately pretty bad lives yeah so um, my personal stance is I usually the way I say it in the talk is the these animals uh, deserve negative rights to begin with, right? Mm. Uh, because I also believe that we should get to positive rights. Uh, for example, if like I would like to start with negative rights and then end up with positive rights because of the fact like if I'm on the street and this has happened, I see a suffering dog. I believe that that dog has the right that I take them or any other human takes them and sees what's happening to them and yeah. escape them and, and everything if they have means of course and um do i think that we should do the same with wild animals yes the only reason i don't talk about wild animals specifically to be very very honest is because because i cannot even imagine what type of um intervention we can even create to start targeting the case of wild animals mm. And, and this is a topic that I, I discuss a lot with a few friends of mine who are um, uh, more um, educated, let's say, when it comes to wild animal suffering, because I always think, like, what could we even come up with? And mm. where do you draw the line, right? Um, because some people even count, like, they say, no, it's even, they say it's even more important than farmed animals because their numbers are so much bigger. And that's because they're counting ants and worms and underground creatures and that's where i kind of struggle to completely agree because i i feel like as as much as it's it's about individual suffering there's also in my opinion a certain level of sentience that we should consider looking into like how much a cow suffers in a dairy farm mm -hmm. versus how much a worm suffers on the ground and how much i can do to stop the suffering of a cow versus how much i can do to stop the suffering of a worm on the ground so the discussion that I usually have with my friends is whether or not we could ever come up with a solution for uh, for wild animal suffering. Yeah. Whereas for for farmed animals and, and animals that we're exploiting, we have the solution. It's there, right? We just have yeah. to implement it. Um, so one of my friends said, well, 
we should concentrate on raising awareness about it so that if one day artificial intelligence helps us to find a solution, then people would agree. Um, and yeah, I agreed with that, definitely. <laughs> and great. And uh, as David Pierce was saying in the first talk, if we can't get people to care about, you know, the, the, the cow that's in their beef burger, I don't know how we're going to get them to care about the worm under the ground. <laughs> like, yes. It's yes. Like, yeah, this one's so in front of your face, you know, it's a lot yeah. easier to grasp. And on the topic of wild animal <laughs> suffering, actually, there's just a question from the audience about whether or not it would be immoral for humans to go extinct and allow wild animals to inherit the earth, given that there is a lot of wild animal suffering out there. Uh, I like these questions. That's a good one. Um, is it immoral for humans to go extinct, given the fact that we will leave behind a lot of wild animal suffering? So that 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 the question, I think it's a difficult, difficult question because it kind of already carries the the like creates a fact that if we were not to go extinct, we would definitely find a solution to wild animal suffering. So the, mm. the is creating the 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 idea that we would find right whereas i'm yeah. very skeptical of whether or not we would and so then my personal answer there would be well when do wild animals wild animals suffer more with us on the planet or not on the planet um i, I would think we create more wild animal suffering by existing on this planet uh, actually, not wild animal suffering, but overall animal suffering by yes. existing on this planet than by not existing on this planet. Because if we're not on the planet, then there are tens of billions of animals that are not being, um, well, basically bred into existence. So we're taking all of that away, uh, which, um, at least when it comes to mammalian animals, is, uh, I think, wild animals, someone can correct me. I, I believe they're less than 5% or 10% of animal population um so maybe even four percent is the number i remember but some, anyone can correct me in the comments of course um so i do think that it's there will be less overall suffering without humans existing because of the fact that we wouldn't be breeding all these animals into existence which put the numbers together are much higher than the number of wild animals Interesting. Well, just on the topic of wild animal suffering, we do have our talk with Oscar Halter. I'll quickly plug oh, nice. that. But um, one of the big causes of uh, extinction in wild animals at the moment is, of course, animal agriculture. Yes. And yes. I do use that as a counterexample to people who say that humans are having a positive impact on the world by reducing the amount of wild animal suffering. But if they're replacing rainforests with factory farms and, you know, like, intensively farmed fish which is just a huge number of beings yeah um i'm not so sure this is a positive yeah. impact just going through these audience questions oh an interesting one about rights so as you were saying in the talk there's not a morally relevant trait between humans and other animals mm -hmm. uh does this mean that they are therefore equally morally valuable I've thought about this many times because I, I like to ask myself hypothetical questions to see where I have um, uh, difficulties in answering questions or, or hypothetical questions simply. Um, so I ask myself, like, for example, if I'm driving down the road and, and I have to have to in this hypothetical situation hit, let's say, um, I don't know, um, I'm not, I'm not going to say a dog because everyone's so emotionally charged with dogs, but like, let, let's think about um, any other animal. Um, a deer. Say, it, quite, it happens quite a lot in the UK. People let's might run let's over say a, a raccoon. Okay, deer, a raccoon. <laughs> deers are so cute. Um, oh, Bambi. I didn't think about that Bambi is... Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, uh, so if really I were to choose between a raccoon and a human, um, and let's imagine that, that I would not face any legal... Um, uh, consequences if I were to hit the human, let's imagine, for the sake of the hypothetical uh, situation, uh, which one would I feel worse about? Um, to be very honest, I, I personally would feel worse about the human. And again, to be very hon honest, I don't know why. I do believe that each um, species like of animals, we all have, we're kind of wired to feel more empathy towards our own species. 
um, because I could sit down and come up with with um, explanations why I shouldn't feel worse for the human. Like I could say that human could be this, that human could be that. Like oh, I'm overall mm -hmm. suffering is reduced because of what happened, the accident, you know. But still, for some reason, I would feel worse, and that reason could just be societal conditioning, right? But I don't know what it is. Um, so I struggle to claim which species has more um, more relevance or value than the other. I just know what I would feel in specific situations. Uh, on the other hand, someone can say, um, if if you were to save your three dogs from being thrown, um, I don't know, down a, a building or something, or let, let's say a, a much more quick death um, versus a, a stranger human, right? I would save my dogs. And, mm. and there is, because there is an emotional connection. So it, it, it's a very difficult question. And I can, I can see myself choosing different species depending on the hypothetical situation. And in each specific example, my justification is gonna be a different one. Um, so if anyone can come up with a better answer than that, I'm more than happy to listen. Uh, it's a tough one. It's one I've thought about as well. And I do think that fortunately for the issue at hand today, like the main issue with respect to veganism, antinatalism, which is breeding these animals into existence, we're not forced to choose the either or. <laughs> but yes. I always get caught in a situation where it's like, well, if you were on a boat and there was that cabin boy we talked about earlier or a pig, which one would you eat? And I always yeah. think, well, when I'm in that situation, I'll let you know next time. I'm <laughs> We've got a few minutes um, before we wrap up. I uh, just wanted to ask you a couple of questions about the Middle East Vegan Society and in general, uh, your community building in the Middle East. Firstly, how's it going? And also, are there any lessons that you can have for like building a healthy antinatalist community from your experience of community building? Um, well, if... Uh... If the antinatalist community is anything like the vegan community, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, th I think I think it's always difficult um, because, and I think it, I have a good explanation of why it's difficult. Um, before I get to Middle East Vegan Society and the work that we're doing there, I think it's very common to see infighting and what people refer, refer to as drama or problems mm -hmm. or people falling apart in the animal rights movement. The reason for that is because people assume that just because they have this thing in common that they would get along. That is as ridiculous to assume that because I and another person on the street believe in human rights, then we would get along. Yeah. It makes no sense. Of course, you're not gonna get along with everyone. That, that, that's a given. It, it's, it's, it blows my mind that people think that it should be like, oh, that person is a vegan. Of course, we're gonna get along. It makes no sense. Um, so I think personally, the, the key, uh, factor of creating a healthy community is communication. If you don't mm -hmm. have the communication, because you're going to have people disagreeing on things, regardless of what community you're in, but if you don't know how to communicate, then forget about having a healthy community. You know, you, you have to be open to communicating about things. Um, just yesterday morning, someone reached out to me on behalf of someone else who was at one of my lectures and took a very big stance about something specific I shared unrelated to human, to animal rights. And, um, and she genuinely reached out to that person to reach out to me to ask if I'm open to discuss the topic privately, not even like publicly. And now we're sending each other voice messages discussing the topic. And you know why, like that just shows like you can make drama out of an issue or you can just communicate in a healthy manner i yeah. doubt this person and i are ever going to be on the same maybe we will be i don't know but i doubt it because of like very specific things i want to get it i don't want to get into yeah but the fact that she took that step to have healthy communication with me i helped i thanked her for doing that she thanked me for taking the time as well so that helps a lot uh, when it comes to the least vegan society it's going great i do want to uh, specifically clarify one thing um, I helped co-found the Animal Rights Center in Lebanon. So, and that's unrelated to Middle East Vegan Society. So I helped co-found that. And then I founded the Middle East Vegan Society. 
Um, and I want to mention that because I don't want to take credits for the Animal Rights Center in Lebanon. That was mainly the work of Lebanese vegans. I was just help, trying to help out uh, in, in uh, funding it. Founding it. Uh, the Middle East Vegan Society's work is going great. Um, we, you know, I'm born and raised in Lebanon, and I, I knew that this is one area of the world that is completely neglected when it comes to animal rights. Uh, we are technically the only organization, uh, animal rights and, and vegan organization that is doing the type of work that we're doing. There are a lot of grassroots groups, by the way. We, we're not the only ones. So I want to make that clear. There are grassroots groups such as Lebanese vegans, Jordanian vegans, Palestinian vegans, Egyptian vegans in Morocco, so many places, Saudi Arabia, um, uh, in the United Arab Emirates, there are vegans. In Iraq, you can check out on Instagram, there's an Iraqi vegan antinatalist page, right? So um, vegans and animal rights activists are all over the Middle East and North Africa, but it's a very neglected region. And we wanted to basically put the activists and the work that they're doing and the movement in general um, on uh, like our pages and give it a platform because of the fact that more Western-based organizations and, and vegan news platforms have been ignoring um, and neglecting this specifically. So we wanted to fit to address that problem and also create content on animal rights and veganism in Arabic, which is one of the top five most spoken languages in the yeah. world. And so we're working on a project with that. We are very soon in, in the next two weeks launching our Vegan Islam Initiative, which is a project that has been developed by, um, I, I was not involved in the research since I'm not a Muslim myself, but it was developed by uh, ethical animal rights activists who are also religious Muslims. And so uh, some of them are vegan because of the scripture and the religion. Mm -hmm very convinced by it. So they, they put together this initiative that shows that not only can you be a vegan as a Muslim, but, but the scripture actually would um, encourage you to speak out uh, for, like speak up for animal rights. Um, so that's going to create a lot of um, noise, I'm sure, when it comes yeah. out. But it's not interpretation or anything. It's like factual information about the scripture that is out there. Um, so very excited for that as well. It will be launched both in uh, right and English as well. And um, we already have many organizations worldwide who have asked us to translate it to other languages. And yeah, we have a bunch of projects for next year as well, but taking it one thing at a time. <laughs> oh, no, definitely. That's a good bit of advice about not yeah. uh, biting off more than you can chew. But thank you so much, Seb. Um, as we mentioned before, we're going to be sending around our newsletter after this with links to all of Seb's work. So please do check those out. And we'll be back in a few minutes' time for a talk with Matty Hyrie about antinatalism and extinction. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.